Today is a special day for Jane. She's about to dramatically change the lives of four chronically ill people by donating one of her kidneys to a complete stranger. So why is she doing this? And what happens once someone makes that decision? Jane lives in Perth, Western Australia with her partner Alex and their five-year-old greyhound Polly. After working as a vet nurse for 10 years, Jane decided to change direction and took up a job at Sir Charles Gardner Hospital, Perth. I started working admin and medical typing in the renal department and that's attached to the dialysis ward of the hospital. And through that, I could see all of the nurses helping the patients with kidney disease and also the doctors helping the patients with their medications and patients having transplants or waiting for transplants. My name is Aaron Chikira. I'm a renal physician here at the renal department at Sir Charles Gardner Hospital in Perth, Western Australia. And we are looking after patients who've got kidney diseases of, of all sorts. Uh, and also patients who are interested in potentially donating a kidney for the purposes of transplantation. So we will look after people who've got very mild kidney disease and start uh, initial assessments on those through to people who've got very advanced kidney impairment and are on dialysis. And we also have quite a large transplantation uh, transplant population here, so people who have received a transplant or are being worked up for the purposes of transplantation. Most people are thankfully born with two kidneys and from a fairly practical perspective, the kidneys are filtration organs to get rid of waste products. So you have blood on one side of the kidneys being filtered through to bank urine on the other side and taking away a whole lot of toxins that would normally build up day to day. Once a patient develops end stage kidney disease, there are only two options, receive a kidney transplant or go on dialysis. So there's hemodialysis, which involves taking blood out from the individual, pass through a machine that filters out the toxins and then delivers that purified blood back to the individual. An alternative uh, regimen is something called peritoneal dialysis, and that involves a tube, a plastic catheter that goes into the abdomen People put some fluid into their abdomens, usually several times a day. The fluid's left to dwell for a few hours. That will drain out the toxins because of the composition of the fluid. And then that's drained back out of the individual and a new bag of fluid is put in. When someone's on dialysis, a lot of their life is restricted in a lot of uh, ways that make it difficult for them to have a regular daily life. It's possible, but you have to put a lot more thought and planning into it. It's just, it's almost like a full-time job, but it's just staying alive and staying comfortable. When you go to the Dallas unit, you see the people on Dallas are really suffering. I don't think they have a good quality of life. For example, on hemodialysis, every another day you come to the hospital, sitting on the chair for four hours. After that, you know, the patient has been washed out, they feel very dizzy, not comfortable. Then just after they recovered from that, they will be due for another dialysis, otherwise their body cannot cope. One of the options for people who have end-stage kidney disease, so their kidneys have effectively failed, is transplantation. And we know that for patients who are in that circumstance, generally transplantation gives better outcomes than dialysis. Three years ago, Claire had a kidney and pancreas transplant after suffering many years of ill health. I couldn't believe it. It was... It was ev everything I wanted and more. You know, that so rarely happens. I'd had such a bad time on dialysis. And then I got the transplant and I just felt like I was walking on air for the, f I'm still so thankful um, every day. I still feel so happy. It is, and that's a, a beautiful description of it. It is life-changing for these individuals. So they've, they've gone from dialysis, sometimes not feeling particularly well, but managing, kind of keeping going on dialysis, to having effectively a normal existence. Again, they don't need to come into hospital uh, three times a week. They don't need to do these exchanges at home. They don't need to have their home medicalized by all of the equipment required for dialysis. Uh, and with uh, the sake of a few tablets and admittedly at the beginning, quite a lot of hospital visits, but then after that, hopefully not so many, they can have a fairly normal life again. 
Transplantation can get rather complicated, so let's follow the journey of a hypothetical person, who we'll call John, until he finally receives his donated kidney. John has been a kidney patient and has now reached end-stage kidney failure. He joins thousands of other Australians who rely on dialysis to stay alive. One way John could receive a kidney transplant is to join the deceased donor waiting list. The waiting list is made up of patients with end-stage kidney disease who are suitable to receive a kidney transplant. They go through an extensive workup procedure and their individual blood types and antibody makeup are determined, shown here in different colours. Then starts a long wait for a new kidney from a deceased donor. So these are people who unfortunately have passed away but have expressed their wishes to donate an organ. That forms probably the majority of our uh, donation pool at the moment. But we also have a number of individuals who will come forward to become living donors of kidneys. So we have an extensive workup process for those individuals to make sure that they are suitable to be donors and to make sure that we look after their health both before donation and in the event that they become donors after donation as well. And in kidney transplants, basically there's a global issues about the kidney shortage. So we need more organ donors and uh, then we can get more people to get a kidney transplant. One of our goals is actually to try and grow our living donor program, uh, partly because our data suggests that living donors generally provide better outcomes for our recipients where there is an appropriate living donor available. There are what we call sort of directed donations. So this would be living donation to a spouse or a relative or a very close friend for which there is a pre-existing history. Uh, and then there's what we call non-directed donation or the altruistic donor pathway. So these are individuals who have often seen how devastating kidney disease and life on dialysis can be for individuals and they come forwards to present themselves to be donors to go into the general pool uh, and improve outcomes for people with kidney disease. So a lot of living donors are related to the recipients and so from an immunological perspective the organ doesn't look as foreign um, as it might do from our standard deceased donor pool. Our donors are very healthy by virtue of the fact that they are eligible to be donors. And unlike a deceased donor operation, which will occur whenever there is a donor available, um, the living donor operations are planned. And so we're working towards almost an elective surgical date rather than something happening in the middle of the night. Working in the renal department, I was also helping support the renal transplant team, which is made up of some nurses and a registrar, and then all of the renal consultants will work with that team if they have patients undergoing a transplant. So through that, I learned more about the donation process, and they also have an education night once or twice a year where they get patients and families and close friends of patients that are being worked up for transplant to attend. And I thought it would be interesting just to go to that talk and see what kind of information there was about it. So I went to that and got a bit more practical information about it. And I had sort of been thinking about it before then, but didn't really say anything. And then once I had, I you know, thought about it for a little bit longer, but decided that I, I did want to try and do that myself. Jane came to us as a potential altruistic donor in this circumstance uh, and so I guess one of the things that we first look at, uh, do they really understand what it is that they are getting themselves into and we were lucky in Jane's case that she had seen a kidney unit and she knew exactly what um, kidney donation and transplantation and end-stage kidney disease involved for individuals. The first step was talking to the renal transplant nurse coordinator and saying, I want to start the process. I want to donate my kidney uh, in a non-directed fashion because I don't know anyone that needs one. And so then I had an appointment with her 
to talk a bit more about it and started the formal process. So yeah, usually it starts like that when we get either a phone call or someone approaches us via email or even in person and you know expresses the interest to donate. What will happen is from that initial contact we will start to educate the donor. We will commence what we call the workup. We talk to them about um, what the process involves from the start to finish, from now until perhaps if they go ahead and donate the kidney. I felt very supported from that first meeting that the nurse and the team would be advocates for me, not just the recipient of the kidney. I'm on your side. So basically this is something where you can always come with any questions, any concerns, any doubts. There is no pressure whatsoever to go ahead with the donation. Sometimes people feel inspired and they think that, yes, I want to do that. And then the reality of the whole process kicks in. Um, sometimes people might be worried about their health um, in the long term, in the future. And so if they don't feel that this is the right thing for them to do, it's absolutely fine. We will support you whichever way you choose. Um, and yes, if, if it's the right thing for you to do, we want to make sure that you're well informed and well educated about what's involved. So I needed to go see my GP, uh, talk to them about wanting to donate a kidney and have them run a couple of basic tests like blood tests, a skin cancer check, STI checks. And they also had to write me a referral letter to see a renal consultant, which is a kidney specialist doctor. And then I made the appointment to go see them. I saw my doctor the first time, Dr. Aaron Shakira, at Hollywood Specialist Center and had a, a decent length appointment with him so that he could go over all the risks of the surgery, sort of answer any question I had and do a basic physical exam of me as well. Um, poke me in the abdomen, see how I was feeling about everything and make sure I understood what was going to happen next. We will be seeing these patients often as our own dialysis patients or as referrals from colleagues and really talking them through what does it mean to be worked up for transplantation, what are the investigations that we will need to do, how long those investigations might take, what might the risks be of being a kidney donor and the workup process and investigations, what might we find along the way, but also what are the social and psychological implications of being a kidney donor uh, and all the way through to the operation again and what we will do in terms of the follow-up period. Transplantation is, is not an individual pursuit, it is, a, it is a multidisciplinary team of us here who work towards both the recipient workups and also donor workups for transplantation. So it's a team of doctors, nurses, uh, pharmacists, psychologists, psychiatrists, uh, surgeons uh, and our specialist transplant nursing staff uh, all coming together so that we can ensure that the right people are being worked up and the right tests are being done at the right time to ensure that people are suitable for transplantation uh, and that the risks are minimised as far as we can. And most of that, uh, the hard work is actually done by our transplant nurses. Uh, who are keeping a track of all of these people who are being worked up at various points through their journey uh, and making sure that all of the necessary investigations have been done. It's very important that the donor trusts the system, you know, the medical system as a whole, but especially the team and the hospital where the transplant's going to be taking place. I was the most important person in that process as far as they were concerned. It is basically driven by the donor. It is basically also up to them whether they are where they are at and how they feel. If they are happy to proceed, then they will be contacting us usually to say, hey, where am I up to? What is my next test? Some donors might never return the calls or they will never come back to us and that's okay too. They might have come to conclusion, this is not the right thing for me to do right now or ever. <laughs> For one thing it does is obviously increase the number of donors that we have available and we know we have far more people waiting for kidneys than we have kidneys available so we're getting somebody off dialysis who otherwise would be left on dialysis so that in itself is an amazing opportunity for them. 
Uh, sometimes it provides us opportunities to provide a transplant for people who might not otherwise be able to get a transplant, for example, if they have particular uh, immunological reasons. And in the setting of these altruistic donors becoming part of the paired kidney exchange pathway, often that can be the, the priming pump to lead to a large chain of potential transplants across the country. Uh, and there is some lovely modelling that's showing that these altruistic donors can make a huge difference in those uh, national matching programs. Uh, so this works on the principle that ideally we might have a donor and a recipient that you would be exchanging a, the donor donating a kidney to the recipient but sometimes for a number of reasons the donor may not be able to provide the kidney to that particular recipient. For example they might have the wrong blood group or there might be particular antibodies that means that the risks would be too high. So rather than saying, sorry, we can't proceed, one of the things that we can look at is saying, well, maybe your donor can't donate to your particular recipient, but your donor may be able to donate to another recipient somewhere else in the country, and their donor might therefore be able to donate to your recipient. So you could have a two-way exchange so that everybody wins. Uh, and obviously with uh, some very clever computer matching, you can make far more complicated chains so that everybody can win where each individual pair wouldn't have been able to donate and receive an organ respectively. Let's take a closer look at this chain with John and his donor as the first pair. There is no one to donate a kidney to John and get the chain started. This is where altruistic donors become so valuable. Also the chain can't be completed until the final donor has someone to donate his kidney to. In chains like this, the final kidney is donated to someone in the deceased donor waiting list, who is also a good match. The chain is now complete. Between now and any potential operation, so we'll continue to liaise with the potential donors when the match runs are occurring, so they occur four times per year. So at the end of those negotiations, hopefully we've managed to get through to a date that we would be working towards. Uh, and at that point, really, the surgeons will be taking over, although we've always said we are available for discussion. So the current surgical technique is basically is what we call minimal invasive technique. It's in lay word is a K-hole surgery, or medically we say laparoscopic surgery to remove a kidney. So the benefit by using this technique is patient got the smaller cuts, is a better cosmetic appearance, and less pain, quick recovery to the work. This actually also increases the donor pool because people feel less scary about to have a surgery and to give a kidney. So it's about each of the donors and recipients timing being appropriate. It's about theatres and theatre sessions being available with the right surgeons and anaesthetists. Uh, and one of the caveats for this is that all donors proceed with their operation at the same time, in real time, across Australia. Um, so for example, that might mean our theatre team and surgeons coming in to start their operation here at 5 a.m. Perth time because that fits with 7 a.m. theatre uh, commencement time somewhere over in the eastern states. Uh, and so all of those things need to be synchronised and the logistics of then organising for these kidneys to travel across Australia and then be re-implanted. So even just the practicalities of, okay, which flights can we make if we start theatre at this time, therefore we can get the recipients in at this particular time down the track. So there's a very complex set of uh, calculations and logistics that are running behind the scenes to make it all work. The time is finally here when all the planning and organisation comes into play. Something weird's happening to my bed. So I'm feeling a little bit nervous, but pretty much okay. Everyone knows what's going on. and I feel like everyone's organized and so everything's going the way that it should be. I think I'm just, I've got too much spare time at the moment to think and nothing that I actually have to do myself. <laughs> so next I'll meet the nurse and then some of the doctors, maybe the surgeon and the anaesthetist before they finish for the day and find out what 
the plan will be for tonight. So what time I need to stop eating and fast and then get prepared tonight so that the nurses can wake me up at like four tomorrow morning before I have my surgery. Well, I think it's an alpha left, but okay. it could have been an alpha leak. All right. Four other people <laughs> in Australia are going to get a new kidney and three other people like me that were going to give a kidney. So I thought there's eight, there's eight other people right now that are having the same kind of stress and anxiety as me, possibly even more because some of those people are already sick and they've got kind of personal investments because they're trying to help someone they know get better. So I thought, I don't, I don't feel alone in this, even though I'm not personally connected to them, I'm not talking to them. Um, it kind of helped. And also all those other teams, you know, for each of those people, there's another team, the same size as my team, that's looking after them. So that's a huge amount of people invested in making sure that things go well. <laughs> so how are you feeling? Yeah, I'm okay. Sore. Sore? But only really sore where I expect to be sore. So that's okay. Do you think you, I mean, it's a, it's a huge deal and I suppose you're very, you're very chill about it and relaxed about it, but it is a huge deal. Do you, do you realise the enormity of, of the gift that you've given? Um, probably not entirely, no. <laughs> Um, but like it's, it's helped through the journey talking to a lot of other people that have been on both sides of it and I think meeting other people that have had donations of all different like body parts has, has helped me to kind of get my head around that too. Now that the surgical process is over, most of most of my input, most of my work is, is done now. I, all the appointments and things that I have to have now are just about checking that I'm okay, that I'm recovering okay. Anything that I do now isn't gonna affect the donor. Whereas before, anything that I might do, any test results or scans for me or could have potentially affected how the surgery would go. So now it is kind of, I feel like it's just about me um, so it does feel different, but that's just the next step in the whole, the whole kind of event. I do feel satisfied because I know that it's, it's happened. All the important stuff's happened. You know, four people got a new kidney. I've, I've heard that everyone's doing okay, but I won't hear anything more vague than that. And that's fine, but that was still really nice to hear that, that people are doing okay. Um, because as I went home from the hospital, I thought that, you know, those other people will be coming home from hospital soon too. And then the recipients will be coming home from hospital and they'll be experiencing maybe the first time in years that they don't have to have dialysis anymore. Um, and that they can do things that they couldn't do before. I was slowly working up to doing things that I could do normally, but these people are not just returning to life, before the surgery, they're returning to like an even better life. Maybe, maybe a life that they had five, 10 years ago, maybe a life that they've never had because they've, they've been ill for so long or because they're young and they, they don't remember life before their kidney disease. What would you say to that person who received your kidney? I don't think I really need to say anything to the person who received my kidney because I don't have any expectations or concerns about what they do. What they do with their life is entirely their choice and me giving them a kidney really doesn't affect that. I mean, I hope that they take care of themselves, but some people say I hope that they take care of the kidney, but I don't really see the kidney as separate to them. It's in, it's in their body now, it's now theirs. It's not my kidney. It's like you give someone a gift and if they want to sell it or get rid of it, it, it's theirs. They're allowed to do what they want with it. Of course, I hope that they're healthy and well and they live a good life, but I hope that for everybody. Um, and also I won't know. Whichever one they do, I won't know anyway. So um, I don't really need to worry about it or think about it too much. I can just say in my head that they are looking after it and 
leave it at that really.